stuff. Ooh, that's not good stuff. That's loud stuff. Forgive me for getting comfortable. It's hot up here. Whew. <clears throat> Maybe that's a sign of what this message is going to be. Who knows? When was the last time you heard a hot one? Hey, turn over to Romans chapter 12 with me. This is one of my favorite passages because it's all about changing. <laughs> How many of you like to change? Not, not like making money change. I mean, like, I want to do it my way, and I don't want to change my way, because my way is the comfortable way. Amen? Well, get uncomfortable, because today is all about change. Today is all about transformation. We've been talking in this series, this Road to Recovery series, we've been talking about our hurts, we've been talking about our habits and our hang-ups, and we've been talking about those things that just sort of mess up our life. Anybody have any of those? <laughs> You want to get rid of those? Yes. We've been in this series on this road to recovery. And today's step five. We're almost there. There's eight of them. Eight principles. This is, the, this is the fifth one. And if you remember, we talked about before the PowerPoint exploded and it didn't make sense anymore. There was an acronym, and the acronym was the word recovery. Today's the V in that word recovery. And it's simply this. The V stands for voluntarily. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask Him to remove my character defects. In other words, get me out of the way and put Him squarely in the way. Sounds easy, don't it? Sounds like fun. Sounds like something we should all be able to do, but boy, how hard is that to do? Because God, my way is better than your way. Because you don't know what I'm having to deal with. How many times have you said that to him? <laughs> More than once. More than we probably care to count. But it's based on this verse in Romans chapter 12. And it's the first two verses. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. How many of this is the first time you've ever heard this verse? I didn't think there'd be a single hand go up. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not... Conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of, of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, His pleasing, and His perfect will. How are we transformed? We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's where it starts. But wait, I thought this was all about a heart change. Well, it is. Do you know how connected your head and your heart are? Very. <laughs> you can't have one function without the other for very long. You can't have one function very efficiently without the other for very long. You want to change your heart? You have to change the way you think. You want to renew your mind? You have to allow the heart to change. They work together. The way we're transformed is by having our minds change. Today, I just want to simply do three things today. And, and I mean, there's more steps to just these three things, but we're going to look at three things. And we're going to talk about some, some things. Where exactly do my character flaws come from? Have you ever looked in the mirror and said to yourself, man, I'm perfect. There ain't a thing in the world that I wouldn't change. One of these days, I'm going to look in the mirror and look like Ben. <laughs> there ain't a thing in the world that I want to change about me. No, I've never looked in the mirror and said that. I've never looked in the mirror and said, boy, you have made it. But I've looked in the mirror a lot and said, man, you've got a long way to go. I've looked in the mirror a lot and said, I don't like what I'm looking at. And just reached over and turned the light off. It's kind of like when an engine quits in the airplane. You just keep on flying towards the ground, and when you get there, turn the light on. If you don't like what you see, turn it back off because you're going to hit the ground anyway. It's kind of one of those deals. But where do our character defects come from? Why is it so hard to get rid of them, and how in the world... Do I cooperate with God's change process and this step and see God change my heart, see Him change my mind, change my habits, my hurts, my, my makeups, my hangups? How do I cooperate with God to allow Him to do this? Because, you know, it's a two-way street. It's an if-then. It's not a if you save me, God, I'll do this. No, it's a God says, if you will come to me, I will bless you more than you could ever imagine. But it takes a response on our part. So how can I cooperate it's safe to say that. How can I cooperate with God in seeing this change take place? Let's talk about it. 
First of all, we need to identify where is it that my character defects actually come from. You ever thought about that? Why do I have the attitudes that I have? Why do I have this red hair that's got my cheeks tweaked all of my life? I can't wait for it to turn white or turn gone. Then I'll look like all the other guys in the quartet. But it comes from three places. It comes from either a biological source. You know that some of our defects actually come from biology. Some of our defects actually come from the way we're made up. Hmm. We'll talk about that. It may come from a, a sociological source. It may come from the environment that you live in. A whole lot of our defects come from what we surround ourselves with. There's some sociologists that have written books and made lots of money telling us about that. It's a fact. And then there's some theological reasons. Let's call them my chromosomes, my circumstances, and my choices. Those theological defects come all from our choices that we make. That's where our defects come from. Let's look at the chromosome part. Let's look at the biology part. Some of our problems we inherited. Everybody say, thanks, Mom and Dad. <laughs> look at your children and say, you're welcome. <laughs> Some of it is, is inherited. Some of it is biological. That's your chromosomes. Your mom and your dad contributed to some 23,000 chromosomes each in every cell in your body. Don't even do the math because I don't know how many cells there are in your body. And so we inherit some of their weaknesses. Did you know that? We actually inherit some of the problems that mom and dad might have had. Some of our immune problems are inherited. Some of our physical ailments are inherited. Some of our weak bone structures are inherited. Some of our strappingly good-looking, drop-dead gorgeous appearances I'm really not talking about myself, are inherited. You know, it's funny. My sister and I have the same color hair. She loved it growing up. I absolutely hated it growing up. She loved the attention. I couldn't stand the attention. But it's all mom and dad's fault. Either way you look at it. This explains your predisposition towards some problems. You know, some of our emotional makeup is inherited. Some of our emotional reactions are inherited. And unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do about them, except learn how to deal with them. But this explains some of our hangouts sometimes, some of our predisposition, that's a big word, some of the ways that we're already disposed towards doing something come from our chromosomes, come from our makeup, come from the way that we were created by mom and dad, but it's not an excuse to make bad choices. It's not an excuse to sin. Might be something we have to deal with. Might be something we have to learn how to deal with. But it's not an excuse. But man, there's a lot of people that use them as excuses. <laughs> a whole lot of people. Let's just say, for example, because of your parents, you have a tendency to have a hot temper. That doesn't give me the right to go out and lose my temper and murder somebody. It's still a choice. Let's say that I may have a tendency to be lazy. Let's just skip that one. Let's say I may have a tendency to be lazy, but that doesn't excuse me from doing nothing with my life that God has called me to do. I know the tendency is there. Deal with it. Do something about it. I may have a tendency genetically to be given toward a certain addiction. Ask any, any drug counselor. Roosevelt could sit down and take you through this, and, and he has an amazing understanding. There is a chemical dependency that some of it is inherited when you talk about alcohol and drug abuse. But that doesn't give you an excuse to seek it out. That doesn't give you an excuse to accept the addiction because that's just the way I am. My genes and my genetics, my nature, are just a source. They're not an excuse. That's your chromosomes. Then there's your circumstances. Your nurture, if you will, is another source of our habits. The places that we hang out <laughs> are a source of our habits. I catch myself sometimes at the end of the day when I'm at work in that other place of employment all day around some of the people that I'm with. I catch myself, if I'm not careful, gravitating to the negativity that exists there. And I hate it. And I have to do a self-check. Yeah, I'm there eight, nine hours a day most days. But that doesn't give me an excuse to turn away from the love that God expects me to show. 
Just because you're in it doesn't mean you have to become it. Amen? Amen? You were raised a certain way. None of us in here were raised exactly the same. I talked to my brother and my sister, and boy, the three of us had very different childhoods. Same parents, different times. We were raised different. You were raised different. You learn from your parents and you learn from other people. You learn to respond to your own needs in certain ways and how to cover for yourself. Somebody else may respond in different ways. Somebody else may respond in ways that you see hurtful. Somebody else may respond in ways that you don't see very appropriate. But all of us learn to respond in ways. That's our nurture. That's the things we grow up around. That's our circumstances. You may have a legitimate need for respect because of the way you were raised. But if you didn't get respect in an early life, you may settle for attention that you don't need now. That attention may come from some other source. That attention may come from drugs. That attention may come from alcohol. That attention may come from a, a wrong sexual relationship. That attention may come from any other kind of addiction. You may desire the respect, but look for it in a, different, in a wrong way. You may have a legitimate need for love. But if you don't get it, you settle for the cheap versions of love. We have needs because of the way we were raised. We have things that we expect to happen because of our circumstances. But that doesn't give an, ex an excuse to do it the wrong way. And then there's our choices. If you choose to do something long enough, it becomes a what? A habit. Now, different experts will tell you different things and how long that takes. Some will say it takes you... 21 times to do something before it's a habit. It takes you 27 times to do something before it's a habit. You have to repeat the same process over and over 41 times before it becomes a habit, part of your everyday process. Whatever it is, the way we do things, our circumstances, our choices create habits. Once it becomes a habit, good luck getting over it. It's equally as hard, if not more difficult, to reverse the habit once you've got the habit. How many of you are still praying 10 minutes a day? It's hard to make something a habit. You're either not praying at all, or you realize that your 10 minutes a day has stretched into 30, 30 minutes or an hour because the habit has grown. We don't stay static. We're never static. We're always changing one direction or another. Our choices decide that. Why does it take so long to get rid of these things? Why is it so difficult to get rid of, of, of the things that create us? That's, that's what we want to talk about today. I, I, maybe you say, I've tried these different fads. I've tried these different therapies. I've tried all the books and all the seminars, and nothing seems to work. I'm still stuck right where I was because of bad choices or because of bad circumstances or doggone it because of mom and dad. Those are all excuses. And we're better than excuses. Did you catch that? We are better than the excuses. Do you know why? Because you're created to be better than the excuses. You're created to trust in the only one that can get us through. You're created to trust in the only one that can create that transformation, that can create the new habits. So why is it so hard to change the defects in, in my life? Why is it so hard to change these things that have become habitual, these things that have become my hang-ups? There's, there's, there's four reasons. I'm going to share these four reasons with you real quick, and then we're going to get into the the, the how do I cooperate with God part. That's the real meat and potatoes of today. But why is it so hard to change my defects in life? First is this, because I've had them for so long. It's kind of like your favorite old shirt from college. That was a long time ago, but the shirt's still hanging in my closet, and it sure is hard to get rid of it because I've had it a long time. Never mind the size, the fact that it didn't, hasn't fit for the last 11 years. That doesn't matter. One of these days, I'm going to get in shape and get back into that shirt, right? No, I'm not, because I've created the habit that's got me to where I'm at now, so it's never going to happen. Get rid of it. Get rid of the excuse. Get rid of the habit. You didn't get your habits overnight. You realize that, right? You didn't get the way that you do things overnight. It took you years to develop into what you are today. Some of us, it took longer. Some of us haven't been as far on the journey yet. But it's taking you time to get to where you are. Many of the habits and the patterns you've developed in childhood, and they may not be comfortable, but it's what you know. 
Matter of fact, that habit may be self-defeating, but it's what your normal is. Can anybody say amen to that? It's frustrating, but it's what's comfortable. How many times have you <laughs> looked at an old pair of shoes and you say, I need to get rid of these shoes, but man, they sure are comfortable. Never mind the fact that I can count all ten toes. Well, they're broke in. They're nice. Maybe I'll just make them into a pair of flip-flops. No, you've had it too long. It's time to get rid of it. We've had the excuses too long. And we buy into the lie that, well, that's just the way that I am. You ever caught yourself saying that? Pastor, you don't understand. I can't change because that's just who I am. Boy, that is a lie. That is a lie that Satan has got us to buy and to believe. You can change because God's word says that you can change. You can't change because you're still trying to do it on your own. Second part is your identity. Why can't I change this defect is because it's my identity. We confuse our identity a lot of times in the identity of those things. We make those habits our identity when that's not really the case. Our identity is simply this. If you're a Christian, you're a blood-bought child of the risen Savior. Period. There is no habit, no excuse that can take the place of that. That's a reality. That's our identity. I don't know why we often confuse our identity, but we say things like, that's just the way I am. You say, that's the way I am, and I can't do anything about it. I just accept the fact that I'm me. I just accept the fact that whatever it is defeats me. Maybe you can, maybe you can fill in this sentence. This, this just the way I am sentence. Maybe, matter of fact, if you've got something, write this down. Have you ever caught yourself saying, well, it's just like me to be forgetful? It's just like me to be clumsy. It's just like me to be the one that gets in trouble. It's just like me to be whatever. You ever caught yourself saying that? Maybe you're a workaholic. Maybe you're overweight. Maybe you're anxious. It's just like me to be passive and let other people tell me what to do. Maybe it's just like me to be fearful. Maybe it's just like me to lose my temper. And we accept the fact that that's who we are. And it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Have you ever seen that happen? Well, yeah, you told me what date that was, but I knew I was going to forget it. And what happened? I forgot it. I get frustrated sometimes because life gets so busy that I do forget to write something down. And if I don't do it right then... Stephanie's laughing because she deals with me in this all the time. If I don't write it down right then, it's gone. If I don't pull out my phone and put the date in, it's gone. And then what happens, you get a phone call five minutes before you're supposed to have been somewhere, or five minutes after you were supposed to have been somewhere. Where are you? Well, what do you mean, where am I? You were supposed to be here. Oh, well, you know, it's just me. I forget things. We make excuses. We make that our identity, and that's who we become. Anybody know any workaholics? Are any of you workaholics? Did any of you used to be workaholics? <laughs> My wife accuses me of that a lot. Do you know what's hard for a workaholic to do when it's time to relax? You can't. Your brain is continually going. I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. That leads to the forgetfulness. That leads to the frustration, which leads to the anger, which leads to the... I blew it again. That's my identity. We create that and we live it. But it's a lie. We don't have to live that way. There's a payoff. It's hard to change our defects because there's a payoff. We may not realize it, but every single defect that we have has a payoff. That payoff may be what masks our pain. We may be so comfortable with the fact that because this is who I am, I know that this is what the result is going to be. So even though I'm going to have to deal with the frustration, that's okay, I'll get over it. And there's a payoff. I don't have to change when I do that. I don't have to admit a fault when I do that. It may be something like, we create these payoff opportunities and we don't even think about it. Do you know how many kids can count every single fraction between the number two and three? Because if I count to three and you haven't cleaned your room yet, one, 
two, two and a half, two and five eighths. What's the payoff? The kid knows that we're really counting to about 30. We're not really counting to three. Why would they change? We've already created an identity. We've already created the payoff for them. Our circumstances, our habits, our hang-ups do the very same thing to us. There's a payoff. We get comfortable with that payoff. I love the look on their face when I say, I'm going to count to three, and if it's not done, it, boy, your mind, one, two, three. <gasps> You're not supposed to count that fast. <laughs> yeah, it's my turn for payoff now. Hmm. There's a payoff. It's hard to let that payoff go. And then the fourth thing is this. <clears throat> Satan discourages me. Satan kicks me in the rear and says, I got you. Quit trying. And we buy it. We believe it. He is constantly suggesting negative thoughts. You know that? I have tried to kick him in the tail for the last three weeks because the negative thoughts of trying to do something different are always popping up. I think I shared with you the other night that it scares me to death to do what we're doing in the gym right now. That's from Satan. That's him saying, you're trying to change something and it's never going to work. That's him saying, you need to just be comfortable with what is. Just stop. That's him saying, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get their feelings hurt because the color's wrong. Somebody's not going to like the the... What kind of carpet? Somebody's not going to like this. Somebody's not going to like that. You know, those are all lies of Satan. But guess what? We buy them. And we believe them. And we start to doubt. And we start to think that maybe change is not worth it. We start to think that maybe making an attempt to follow something that God's leading us isn't worth it. Because we buy into Satan lies. Good grief, Satan's been defeated for years. He just don't know it yet. And if he knows the Scripture as well as we think he does, he actually does know it, which means he's going to fight even harder to try to stay alive longer. Don't buy into it. He doesn't have control over you. The Bible makes it very clear he's a liar. Makes it very clear that he's a liar. And the Bible says that the truth, which is God's Word, will set us free. So don't buy into his lies. Believe in the truth of what God has for you. Believe in the truth of what he says. But man, it sure is easy when you're laying in bed at night to allow his doubts to start to become truths. To allow his little thoughts to start, to start attacking you. To allow them to start putting a chink in the armor. And then he's got you. And then we're never going to change. But God promises that if we cooperate with Him, we can change. He promises that if we put our trust in Him, He will see us through the change. He'll see us through the transformation. He'll see us through the, the, the getting over whatever that hurt or that habit or that hang-up is. That's biblical. That is a promise from Him. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What do you think of when you think of that word transformed? I can't help it, but I think of the cars becoming, I think of transformers. It's just me. I had the Optimus Prime truck when I was a kid. I thought it was the coolest thing. Of course, Mom got mad at me because I found it two weeks before Christmas, but that's another story altogether. But I got to play with it for two weeks longer. Hey. But that's what I think of when I think of transformers. Wouldn't it be so cool to be a transformer? Wouldn't it be cool to be able to transform into something you're not? Maybe we should transform into what God wants us to be and quit being what we are. Hmm. There's a thought. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your thoughts are your autopilot in life. Yeah, there's another airplane analogy. But our thoughts get us going in a direction. Our thoughts get us fixed in one way. And, and, and it's hard to break out of those thoughts. But you, when you put an airplane on autopilot, you literally turn control over to the computer. You tell the computer where to go, and it goes. You hope. <laughs> yeah, sure, you can take over, and you can start flying the airplane again, but you can't try to fly the airplane at the same time the autopilot's flying the airplane. 
it doesn't work very well. Oh, it may work for a little bit. You may can get a little bit of a turn in this way because this is really the way I want to go. But if you turn too far, you're going to turn the autopilot off. But I don't want to do that. I want it to keep me going this direction. But when I let go of control, guess what the autopilot does? It takes me right back to where I was going. We have those autopilots in life that are our thoughts. We're held captive a lot of times by our thoughts, by those autopilots that keep us going in a direction that is not doing us any good. Turn the autopilot off. How do we do that? How do we cooperate with God to allow Him to help us turn the autopilots off? There's seven ways. Yes, there's seven. It won't take us long, I promise. Seven ways to change your mind so you can cooperate with the way that God wants to change you and make you what you've always wanted to be, which coincidentally is exactly what He wants you to be. First is this, focus on changing one thing at a time. Focus on changing one defect at a time. Focus on changing one habit, one thought at a time. Proverbs 17, 24 says, An intelligent person aims at wise action, but a fool starts off in many directions. Hmm. I wonder if anybody was like this. Man, I've got so many things in my life that I need to change. This series is awesome because I've got about 30 things, and I'm just going to shotgun all of them and change them all at once. Good luck. We're all counting on you. We'll be here to catch you when you fail. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You cannot, I mean, we try all the time, you cannot focus your attention on more than one thing at a time. It is physically, it is mentally, it is psychologically impossible to focus on more than one thing at a time. Don't believe me? Try watching a football game and carrying on a conversation with your wife. It doesn't work. You will get to repeat that conversation later, probably more than once. You can't do it. You can't focus on one problem, more than one problem at a time, and expect to have any kind of effective result. We're not wired that way. We're not created that way. We don't have that capacity. We have the capacity to do amazing things with one thing. But we don't have the capacity to do a lot of things at the same time. It's called multitasking. We, we beat ourselves to death trying to do it. What I would suggest to you is to do this. Pray to God and say something like, God, there is a specific defect in my life that I would like for you to help me work on today. I want you to help me work on this first. I want you to help me work on my laziness first. Because I think if you help me work on my laziness, a lot of the other things will fall into place. I'm just giving you an example. And God, here's what I want you to help me do. I'm going to set the alarm tomorrow morning for 30 minutes earlier than I normally set it. Give me the strength to actually get up when it goes off. I'm not worried about anything that happens the rest of the day. Give me the strength to do that one thing. And maybe tomorrow morning I'll hit the alarm or the snooze two less times than I did today. Guess what? That's a success. Make the prayer a little more specific the next day. God, I hit the alarm, I hit the snooze three times this morning. Would you give me the strength? Would you make that thought forefront on my mind when the alarm goes off in the morning to get up? Help me get over this laziness. And maybe in the morning when you wake up, the first thing that pops into your mind is something that God's put there to make you realize, hey, this is a glorious day. I need to get up and get it started. Mission accomplished. You didn't do it. Because if I relied on myself to do it, I'd still be hitting the snooze seven times. It's nine minutes between each one of them, so I know exactly how long I can hit it and still make it to work. It's kind of cool how that works. But don't just pray, God, make me a better person. What does that mean? He may have an idea that you don't have. And that may scare you. Be specific. When it comes to dealing with our problems, one at a time. Focus on one victory. This is the second part. Focus on victory one day at a time. Matthew 6, 11 says, give us this month our daily bread. Is that really what it says? No, it says give us this day our daily bread. Well, 30 days from now, I'm going to have kicked this habit. Great. What's your plan between now and that 30 days? How about let's worry about tomorrow because you don't even know if you're going to have that 30th day. 
You really don't even know if you're going to have tomorrow. You know you have today. You know you have this minute right now. <laughs> We've seen all too real how quick that minute can be taken away. We don't know what 30 days from now looks like. Let's worry about today. Let's worry about in the morning. Let's do it one day at a time. God wants to give you enough strength to change for that day. Do you know why? If he gave me the strength to last for 30 days, I may lose faith in him by the time that 30 days is here because, whoo, I got this. But if he gives me the strength for one day, I have to rely on him for the next day. And I have to rely on him for the next day. And I have to rely on him for the next day. So do it one day at a time. One problem at a time, one day at a time. What's the third step? Focus on God's power, not my power. We call that willpower. Have you ever willpowered yourself into any kind of a success and there not be consequences? No. Oh, sure, we may power our way through a lot of things, but there's probably consequences. But if we rely on God's power, we really will see the transformation. We really will see the change. We've probably proven to ourselves more than once already that our way is not going to work anyway. <laughs> that our willpower is not strong enough to affect the change anyway. And, and so why not trust in God's power? Matter of fact, trusting on our own strength may actually hinder the transformation. May actually stop the recovery process. How many of you have made New Year's resolutions? Oh, get your hands in the air. We're only a few weeks away from new ones. Have you already thought about what next year's New Year's, new year's resolution is? You know, health clubs have their highest membership drive on January the 1st. By January the 30th, the numbers are right back down to what they were at the end of December. Our resolutions don't mean squat. Because they're ours. Our resolutions don't mean anything. I can resolve to do a lot of things. But it doesn't mean anything unless I trust in God's power to do it. If I trust in my willpower, I'm probably going to find myself worse than I was before I ever made the resolution to begin with. So, that little line I asked you to write down a while ago, that you identify yourself by this. Ask God to help you get rid of it. Ask God through His power to help you eliminate it. Your power's not working. <laughs> My power's not working. I still got things I've got to deal with, and I've been dealing with them a long time. Maybe it's time to turn them over to God. Allow His power to work through you. Don't try to do it yourself. Fourth thing is focus on what I want, not what I don't want. Catch that? Focus on what you want, not what you don't want. How many of you have ever found yourself driving on ice and, and the vehicle starts to slip and slide all over the place and you're trying to steer yourself away from this impending accident? Where do you look? You look at the thing you're fixing to hit and guess what you do? You steer straight towards it and you hit it. How about giving yourself a chance by looking at where you don't want to hit? Let's look at where we want to go and try to steer that way. We just might find ourselves successful in missing what it is we don't want to hit. But we concentrate on what it is that we don't want instead of what it is that we do want. Philippians 4.8 says, Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is good, what is right. Think about things that are pure. Think about all you can praise God for and be glad about those things. Focus on the good things, not the bad things. What happens when you start dwelling on the bad things? Man, that day becomes miserable. What happens when I start dwelling on those doubts that Satan starts putting in my head? I start to doubt. I start to believe the doubt. Well, how about let's focus on the good? Let's focus on what God is providing and not what Satan is trying to destroy. We, we use a a scenario in, in the class that we teach. We call it the white bear phenomenon. And we put a picture of a polar bear on the screen. And I'd tell you to close your eyes and for a minute, don't think about that bear. You can do anything you want to, but don't think about that white bear. And I'm probably going to continue to use the word white bear all throughout that minute. 
And the more I say something about that white bear, the more you're going to think about the very thing that I told you not to think about. You know, we do that every day in our life. We do that with the dread that's in our life. We do that with the bad things that's in our life. We dwell on the bad. No wonder we find ourselves miserable. Why don't we dwell on the good? Think about the good things. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is good, what is right. Think about the things that are pure. Well, pastor, I have an alcohol problem, so I'm going to go hang out at the bar. That's a good plan. You think you're going to beat that problem by putting yourself where the problem is? No. Pastor, I've got a pornography problem, so I'm going to go get on my computer for a little while. And uh, I don't have any filters on the computer or anything, so there's a good chance some of that stuff's going to pop up. But I can beat it. No, you can't. Because you're focusing on it. You're dwelling on it. How many addicts do you know that will tell you they're not really addicts? Probably most of them. I have a cousin that's an... Uh, she'll say she's not an alcoholic. But her activities show otherwise. But what's the first thing out of her mouth? Oh, I can control it. Really? It's worked real well for you this far in life. Quit focusing on the problem and focus on the solution. We just might find the solution. Put your thoughts on the things that are good. Focus on what you like, not what you don't like. How do I do that? Here's a really good example. Here's a really good way to do that. You know, there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible for different things. Memorize a few of them. Memorize one of them a week. Guess what? At the end of a year, you'll have 52 promises that you can dwell on instead of that one bad habit that gets in the way. Hmm, there's a thought. Challenge yourself. You might be surprised. And then when that temptation comes your way to dwell on something that you don't need to dwell on, you may have a promise. It says, fix your eyes on things that are more than you can imagine. You may have a promise of what a day to come will look like. You may have a promise of you can do this because God gives you the strength to do this because I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Fix your eyes on the things that you want, not what you don't want. That's the, th the fourth one. Here's the fifth one. Focus on doing good, not feeling good. Hmm. There is an entire base of Christianity that is based on feeling good. Not what Christianity really is. It's a feel-good religion. Well, if I do good things, I'll feel good. Hmm. I don't know of anybody that got into heaven just because they felt good. I don't know of anybody that could claim the blood of Jesus Christ just because they felt good. No, they had to accept it. And then they have to live by it. And when you live by it, it's going to cause you to do good things by it, not just to feel good. I, everybody has good intentions. Would you agree with that? Intentions never accomplished anything. Well, I didn't intend to go down to the liquor store. I don't care what your intentions were. You wound up there, and now you're drunk, and I'm bailing you out of jail. I never intended to get into that wreck while I was texting and driving. Might be telling on myself there. <laughs> I don't care what your intentions were. Explain that to the mom and dad that just lost their kid because you hit their car. Intentions never accomplished anything. Those good feelings never accomplished anything. Actually do something about it to affect the change that will do something. Don't just accept the fact that I am who I am. And that's all I'm ever going to be. If you remember the third step, it was about that giving over. It was about the salvation piece. It was about accepting and surrendering control of my life and my care to God and to His control. And, and, and that's the step where we hope someone will invite Christ into their life. If that's the case, you're no longer that person that has to have good intentions. Because if that's the case, you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. That's something to do good about, not just feel good about. Amen? So do something with it. If you're, Galatians 5.16 says, If you're guided by the Spirit, you will, know, 
you will be in no danger of yielding to self-indulgence. In other words, you'll do the right thing and not just think the right thing or feel the right thing or want the right thing. You will actually do the right thing. It's hard to turn over control. <laughs> would, you, would you agree with that? It's hard to turn over control and allow God to do good things through you. Well, no one, I can't, no. I, everything I touch just crumbles. There's no way I could do something good. Really? Quit trying to do it for yourself and do it for God. See what happens. Sixth part is this. Focus on people who can help you, not hinder you in making those positive changes I want to make in your life, I want to make in my life. Well, I'm going to go, I'm fighting this alcohol problem, but I'm going to continue to go hang out with my buddies on Friday night to drink. I'm pretty sure I'll rub off on them. I'll get them all to quit drinking too. No, you're going to wake up on Sunday, Saturday morning and wonder what happened Friday night. Surround yourself with people that can do something good for you, not people that will drag you down. That's that whole circumstances thing. The environment that we find ourselves in, the nurture that comes from that environment, put yourself in a good environment. I said this in the first lesson of this series, and a lot of you may not have believed me, but you cannot recover on your own. Period. You cannot recover from whatever it is that you deal with on your own. It takes two things. First and foremost, it takes an, a, a renewed understanding and a renewed feeling of who Christ is in your life. And second, it takes people around you helping you. It takes people around you supporting you. It takes people around you that are like-minded and maybe even dealing with some of the same problems that you can share experiences with and you can share the celebrations with. There is nothing like seeing two alcoholics come to a an understanding of their alcoholism with each other, and then celebrate going through the process of recovering with each other. There is a friendship right there that will last forever. There's a friendship right there that's not afraid to call the other one out. There's a brother in Christ that's not afraid to say, Dude, what are you doing? You're trying to do this all on your own again. You're getting away from what's working. That's what Celebrate Recovery is all about. It's creating that environment. It's creating those friendships. It's creating an opportunity to do it in relation with someone else and not on your own. If you're on your own, you're going to fail. If you're not part of the family, you're going to get pretty lonely. <laughs> it's kind of like the, I've used this analogy before, it's kind of like the, you know, the campfire, the, all these, with it getting colder, you see all these uh, uh, fire pits in people's backyards and I, I want to go build one now. Uh, Trent found one the other day at a restaurant. Somebody may have saw that. He's like, Daddy, we need to build one of these. I'm like, yeah, you're right, we do. Go do it. But <laughs> kind of like the fire pit, the fire is warm. The fire is together creating that heat and doing its job. But what happens when that piece of wood pops and this little coal jumps over here? Initially, it's still pretty hot. It's still glowing. It's still, it's still doing what it does as, a, as an ember. But what happens to it when it's not collectively with the rest of the fire? It, it starts to go out. It starts to lose its heat. It starts to lose its ability to warm you. It starts to lose its ability to do what it's supposed to do. Eventually it will go out. But it doesn't take very long if you scoop it up and put it back in with the rest of the fire. It doesn't take very long for it to become a part of the fire again, does it? We're no different. Pull yourself out and try to do it on your own, you're done. It's just that simple. Focus on people who help you, not hinder you. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, and this is not an unfamiliar verse either. As iron sharpens iron, so people can improve each other. We need to be in those relationships with other people. We call them accountability partners. We call them all kinds of things. But it is imperative that we're in those relationships. That's, we talk about this on Monday nights, the Bible study. We, uh, yeah, we sit around and we open the Word and we share. And, and we, not everybody has the same opinions on things. Not everybody has the same understanding of this verse or that verse. And we share those. And we, don't, yeah, we pick on each other and we have fun with it. But we never belittle anybody. We, we respect each other's ability to think different. And I've walked out of the Bible study before going... 
I've never really looked at that that way. I'm going to have to think about that. But another part of that is the fellowship that comes with it and the closeness that starts to develop with a group of guys that I know I can call and I can trust with something that I'm struggling with. That's what Celebrate Recovery is about, surrounding yourself with those people. We can't do it on our own. We're not created to do it on our own. We need each other. But we need to be surrounded by the right people. I'm going to share one testimony with you this morning. It's a guy named Jerry. Here's Jerry's testimony. He says, several weeks ago I went to a seminar with Pastor John. I'm talking about John Baker, the, the creator of Celebrate Recovery. And several other guys here, and we each had to do separately what I'm about to do with you now. There was about a hundred of us, and this one man spoke up and turned around and looked at all of us, and his knees knocked, and he said, I'm sure that all of you people, one at a time, are really beautiful people, but all together, you're just a little bit overwhelming. You ever been in his shoes? He says, I'm a fellow believer at Saddleback Community Church. I'm also a man who for 30 some odd years of his life chose a life of sin. And I used alcohol to blot out my conscience. The fruits of this life were hospitals, were mental institutions, were jails, there were courtrooms, divorces, cirrhosis of the liver, delirium, and 17 years at unsuccessful attempts at recovery blocked my own self-righteousness, my self-will, and my arrogance. Can anybody relate to this yet? Worst of all was a hardened heart against God and those that sought Him. Eight and a half years ago, this obsession for alcohol was lifted from my life one day at a time by my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Three years and four months later, he took a 43-year-old smoking habit and did exactly the same thing. Why? Because after decades of denial, I finally humbled myself and asked him to please do it for me. It was through his loving grace that I was finally brought to a point where I would voluntarily submit to any and all changes that he wanted to make in my life. His will has given me four years of Bible studies and responsibility here at Celebrate Recovery and leading a men's Bible study that Pastor John gave me six weeks ago. Today, in his infinite wisdom, he has taken this sinful past and has changed it into a useful tool to help those that still suffer from addiction. Ephesians 2.10 says, I am God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance for me to do. My heart tells me that he has given to us that, have, that my heart tells me that he has given to us that have bred free that have been freed from our maladies a road to follow specifically to humble and willingly stay in service to those who struggle with their hopelessness. Please, if your life is being corrupted by wrong character defects, come join us to celebrate recovery and give those you love relief from the pain you are imposing in their lives before it's too late. The Apostle Paul wrote, love this verse. He who started a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day that Christ Jesus returns. Period. I say trust Him with all your heart because I know He loves and forgives you every bit as much as He has loved and forgiven me. That's Jerry's testimony. All of the willpower in the world cannot create that testimony. All of the desire to do it yourself in the world cannot affect that kind of change in a man. It just can't. All the therapies, all the fads, all the seminars, all the books, all the tapes cannot make that change in a person. There's only one thing and one thing only that can afford that change. And it's allowing Christ to make that change through our humility and through our willingness to submit to him our willingness to allow Him to come and be part of us and cooperate with us to make the change. We're never going to do it on our own. Seventh step, last one. Focus on progress, not perfection. Think about that. Focus on the progress, not the perfection. Some of you may have been listening to this series and you say, I don't see a whole lot of change yet. I wouldn't expect maybe a lot of us to do some of this. Because, I mean, let's face it. I don't know that we're dealing with a whole lot of people in this room that have addictions. I know there's people in this room that have been freed from addictions. 
and have been delivered from addictions, and they'll tell you that this stuff is true. But it's a process. It's a process of change. It's not an overnight thing. You don't go one day from being a stone-cold sinner to the next day being Billy Graham and saving millions of people. It, it just doesn't work that way. It's a process. A process of progress. If we expect perfection overnight, we're going to fail in the morning. If that is our expectation, that we're perfect, we're done. That's, that's a word that we struggle with, that whole Christian perfection thing, and that's not what this is about. This is about not focusing on doing everything absolutely perfectly right, but focusing on making progress towards doing things right. You know, that progress may be the daily victory that you need to get to the next day. That progress may be the thing you need to see that you can have faith in God who is leading you somewhere. Focus on the progress, not the perfection. Maybe, maybe your prayer should go something like this. God, I want to voluntarily submit to the changes you want to make in my life, and I humbly ask that you would remove these character flaws from me. And give me the wisdom to see that you're making progress in me. Don't give up. Don't give out. Just continue to believe and continue to have faith that your mind can be renewed, that you can be transformed into who God wants you to be by allowing him to come alongside us and do it with us. Amen? That's the fifth step. That's the transformation part. Last week was the hard part, the inventory, the taking inventory of who we are and the moral inventory that Roosevelt talked us through last week. That's the hard part. It's hard to look inside and say, this needs fixed. <laughs> it's hard to look inside and say, boy, I'm doing this wrong. I need you to fix this. But once we do, allowing God to humbly come in Humbly allowing God to come in and affect that transformation is an amazing place to be. But it only works through Him, and it only works when we surround ourselves with others that can help us through it. Amen? Stand with me. Roosevelt will take us through part six next week, and then we only have two left after that before we get gone and move on to uh, something else. But I want to I wanna let you know about two things. On December the 8th, which is the first Tuesday night in December, actually I think it's the second Tuesday night in December, but December the 8th, we're going to show the movie Home Run. We're going to probably do it in here. Um, if, if, if we have a projector in the gym and it's set up, we'll do it over there, but we'll probably do it in here. We're going to show the movie Home Run. Home Run is a movie about a young man that is trying to do it on his own, recognizes he has a problem, but his way is the right way. That's none of us, right? But comes to an understanding that he can't do it on its own. On his own, It's a promotion movie for Celebrate Recovery. We're going to, Roosevelt's already uh, sending out invitations and, and making it known in places that we're showing the movie. Um, <coughs> it is an open invitation to come to Celebrate Recovery, which starts in January. The, the leadership of Celebrate Recovery has begun to meet and start training, but there's opportunities to volunteer to do things. Um, we're going to provide meals every Tuesday night. We're going to need people to greet people at the doors. We're going to need uh, uh, prayer partners. Uh, we've got a, a prayer leader that's organizing all that, but we're going to need people that are willing to just pray. We're going to need all kinds of things. If you are interested and want to volunteer, um, would you see Roosevelt or see myself and, and, and let us steer you in a direction that, that you could be used with Celebrate Recovery? Um, I can't tell you the, just the excitement that I have for it and that Roosevelt has for it. And the excitement that this has really kind of surprised me, that the other pastors on our zone have for what we're doing for that need in our community has almost been overwhelming to me. And I just, I can't wait to see what God's going to do through it. Um, I just believe it's going to be something incredible. And if you want to be a part of it, come talk to me. Come talk to Roosevelt during lunch. I can assure you there is something for you to do. 
Um, we need to get the gym finished so that we can do these things. So if you want to help out, come next Saturday. We'll be, we'll be busy next Saturday. I'll point you in a direction to get something done. Um, so we're going to go over there and eat.